Dylan Stevens, welcome to the Fuse Life Podcast, brother. How you doing? I'm good. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So you are an exercise scientist, is that correct? I wouldn't call myself a scientist, but I do have a degree in exercise science. So with your degree, what have you been able to do? I see you on Instagram a lot. Is that a full-time business for you? It is full-time. Yeah, actually, it's it's like double full-time. Honestly, I have a full-time job in person, training clients in person. And I also train clients online and that's all through Instagram. So it ends up being a lot of hours every week. So what takes up more of your time is actual training? Is it editing the videos? What What's killing your time right now? That's a good question. I think a lot of it is replying to text messages to current clients, replying to, to DMs on Instagram. This is a remote job. So I can't talk to people unless I'm constantly texting people. So I'm just constantly reading texts, sending messages, viewing technique videos of some of my clients, some of my remote clients, they'll send me videos of their technique. Takes up a lot of time doing that. But in person, um, it's one hour sessions. It's just one one hour session at a time, usually around three or four um, personal training sessions per per day. But um, mostly text and in-person sessions, yeah. You know what that sounds like to me is there was a, a recent Netflix uh, thing on the Florida Gators and, and Urban Meyer was talking about right after they won the title, he's on the phone with recruits in the locker room. It was just, it, it sounds like, it sounds like what you're going through. You get done with something, boom, on to the next right away. No time for celebration. <laughs> so uh, tell me about the business a little bit. What do you offer? I offer four primary different services, and that includes a, a personalized exercise program taking everything into account, how many days per week, and maybe any injuries, different equipment they have access to. I have some clients that that don't have access to a gym. They, they have a pair of bands, a couple of dumbbells. The whole program is, is customized to, to what their ability is, what their goals are, experience level, all of that. Also diet and nutrition coaching, that's huge, especially if you're trying to lose weight. That includes kind of just tracking my clients, you know, daily calories, protein. I can see everything that they log on, on the training app. Uh, the other one is the technique analysis. Technique analysis is huge, but I've, I have some clients that don't, don't utilize the technique analysis. Very, very big. I mean, I'm a personal trainer. When people think about personal trainers, they think about technique and somebody watching your technique. That's another thing. And then weekly phone call check-ins is another thing that I offer. So out of those four offers, depending on how many of those services the client would want, that is what the price is determined by. Gotcha. All through Instagram, though. I don't use any. I did use uh, YouTube for a while. I did make a bunch of YouTube videos. I haven't done that in a bit, which I probably should. But mostly on Instagram. Yeah, YouTube's really hard. YouTube's hard to figure out. I've got, what, 2,500 or so uh, subscribers now, but it's it's taken a while, and I have no idea when they show up or why they show up. It just it seems to come in waves, and it's YouTube's just really hard to figure out, man. It's all the AI algorithm stuff. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So. With the fitness industry, especially online being so big, why did you choose to take the plunge into uh, let's start a business? Like, were, were you a little bit apprehensive about it or you're like, let's just go all in and get it done? This can actually be quite a long story. So I graduated college in 2020 in the pandemic, the heat of the pandemic. I played baseball in college. So 15 games into our season, we the season got canceled. We got sent home. So I was at home finishing up the degree, taking online classes. I got a job at a liquor store that my mom was accounting for. Um, so I was just working from home, working at uh, working on my degree, working at a liquor store. I graduated, got my degree in uh, the spring of 2020. Towards the end of 2020, I started to DoorDash, and I had so much time in my car, and it was a pretty good gig. I mean, I could work whenever I wanted. So I would go out DoorDash, and then I would flip on some sort of self-help, motivational, financial audiobook. And after listening listening to dozens and hundreds of hours of these self-help books, audiobooks, I kind of came to the conclusion that I'm not going to get what I want out of life working a nine-to-five job. And I have a certain set of skills that I've gained through one, the degree. Yeah, everybody wants to talk about the degree, but I've also been lifting since I was 13. I've learned just as much, if not more, about lifting weights from experience. The degree only taught me the, the in-depth science stuff of, of things. So I, I watched this one guy on YouTube named Alex Becker, and he made these insane, like these awesome finance videos, like personal finance video, business videos. So I was like, wow, I have a degree 
I have all this time. I, I have all this experience in, in lifting weights. I've had friends ask me to train them before. So why don't I just like start something online? The whole point was just starting an online business. Online business has been huge, especially since COVID. So I was like, I'm really good at this one thing. I'm probably better than a lot of other people at this one thing. I could talk about it for hours. I can easily make an Instagram page out of this. So I started the Instagram page in early 2021. I wrote a diet nutrition ebook. I wrote out the layout of the whole business, how I wanted it to be run. And by the end of 2021, in August, I had like 100 posts. I was running advertisements to my Instagram. I was getting good followers every day. And I decided, I don't know how to go. I don't know where to go from here. So I actually had somebody reach out to me randomly on Instagram. And they were like, Hey, you know, I have this friend who, who does uh, Instagram marketing for fitness pages. You should check them out. So I checked them out. And he actually had a course, an online fitness business course. So I bought his course. I went over everything. Keep in mind, all the money in my bank account went towards this course at the time. So I spent all my money on this course. because I, I had no idea what to do. I didn't know how to actually get clients. So in the course, he told me to do a two-week free trial. So I sent out thousands of voice messages. I sat down at my house and sent hours and hours and hours of voice messages saying the same thing. Hey, I have a two-week free trial. So I got like 30 people to sign up for this two-week free trial. A third of them decided not to continue. A third of them said, reach back out in a few months. And a third of them signed on. So right then and there, that first month, I had started and I had like 10 clients right off the bat. So that, that's how it started. And ever since then, it's more... It's more or less been a lot of the same. Just post, post to your to your reels, post to your stories, reach out to your new followers, run ads, do a great job with your current clients. That's number one, of course. That's the story. It's long, but it's it's remarkable. It sounds like Mark Cuban kind of says on Shark Tank sometimes: go door to door, knock on the door, talk to somebody. You know? Yeah. A big part of it is just humility, and a lot of people. You know, I've talked to some trainers around my age or people. You know, trainers that will say they'll, they'll say I'll never do something for free or I'll, I'll never do that. Or they won't go above and beyond unless they get paid for it. So as of right now, I feel like I'm at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of training. So I don't feel like I have the right to request these things. Like uh, I'm too good to give away free stuff. I don't feel like that at all. I feel like I still feel like I'm at the bottom of the totem pole, and the only way I can get up is to just go above and beyond and just. Volume. It is volume. It's like door to door. Same thing with Instagram. It's like you'll send 100 DMs and nobody will pro- will reply. Yep. So yeah, you're at the stage where you've got to outwork the next guy. Basically, that's where you're right. at. So how do we find your Instagram? My Instagram is at Stevens Health and Wellness. Okay, and I'll put that on the screen too. I'll I'll link that in the description as well. So yeah, dude, I came across your Instagram while looking up uh, fitness pages, back pain pages, stuff like that. And you're a pretty big dude, man. I mean, you can tell that you've been lifting weights for a while. Has that been all bodybuilding style? Have you dipped into powerlifting? What's your style? I've done pretty much everything when it comes to weightlifting. I've done I've done Olympic lifting. I've done powerlifting. I've done bodybuilding. But I started when I was 13. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I started... I mean, as long as I can remember, I always... Wanted to get those like really tight shirts, the Under Armour tight shirts, because I thought it made my arms look bigger. I was eight years old going to baseball and just I wanted to look big. It's just something I wanted. I'd always done pull ups, push ups. My mom had these little five pound dumbbells in the basement. I was using those when I was like a kid. Like I didn't know what I, I didn't know what I was doing. But something in me just always wanted to kind of look a certain way. I wanted to have big arms like I wanted to have muscles my whole life. So that was initially kind of what the original goal was when I was 13. I was really just screwing around back then. I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, eventually it came to the point where I was seeing good progress a few years in and I started to get a lot better at baseball. And that was something that really opened my eyes. I was like, I didn't think getting stronger would help me hit the ball farther. I didn't think getting stronger would help me pitch faster, but it did. And I was like, wow, like I had no idea. I'm going to go all in in this because baseball was my was my number one growing up. Up until I graduated college, like, I wanted to play professional baseball my whole life. So I've always had those those aspirations, but pretty much throughout high school was just baseball performance training. I, I mean, obviously, I still did some bodybuilding stuff, but college, more of the same. After I graduated college, I didn't have to train for baseball anymore. And I didn't have to worry about my arm, my arm hurting, my shoulder hurting. So I could just go all in. So that's when I really started to just go all in on bodybuilding. And that's when I really started to see some insane progress because... I wasn't pulling my body in all these different directions. I wasn't doing jump training and marathon training and bodybuilding. Like I was just bodybuilding. I did have a little bit of powerlifting in college, towards the end of college. I squatted like 500 pounds. I benched like 300 pounds, but 
I don't, it's not something I really care about anymore. Uh, so you mentioned you started around 13. Is that an age you would recommend? Because I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old boy and uh, just actually had a girl two days ago. But the boys were looking into when are we going to start doing more push-ups, lunges, stuff like that, calisthenic stuff. I'm not getting them started on the weights, but I do want to start some exercise stuff with them because they're in all the sports and I want to start getting a little bit stronger. So what what age do you recommend or have you done any research into that? Yeah, in one of the courses so, in college... In one of the courses in college, actually, we went over this. There's a special populations part of the course. So no, it, it doesn't matter. They can start at two years old. If you, unless you're going to go up to your kid and tell him, hey, don't pick up that laundry basket because it's going to hurt your back. Like kids lift things all the time. Mm-hmm. It's not something that they don't do. All they're doing is putting it into a controlled environment, which actually makes it more safe. People are more likely to hurt themselves taking the weights off of a bar than actually doing the exercise. So. For a kid, I mean, obviously, you don't want to put a 400-pound bar on their back, but they can squat, they can hinge, they can push, they can pull, they can do all these things regardless. They're playing sports. They're doing all these things anyways. Mm -hmm. So if you you put it into a controlled environment where you're telling them exactly how to do something, do it slowly, do it this way, you can start at literally any age you want. I mean, honestly, the earlier, the better. I mean, if you can teach a three-year-old how to squat perfect and you make sure they... They can continuously squat with good technique as they grow up. Like you can start them lifting weights when they're 18 and they're going to start so much further ahead than somebody else that that didn't practice that kind of stuff. So it's not going to stop their growth. It's not going to do anything crazy like that. As long as they're doing things right under a controlled environment, any age, really. That's good to know. That's something I've always wondered is when to get them started in that type of stuff. You know, when to get them started in contact sports. A lot of people are saying that with football, no tackle before eighth grade, you know, stuff, just stuff to preserve their bodies, preserve their brains, stuff like that. So I've already started them with running. We go running a couple of times a week. Uh, we do about a, between a mile and two miles is where, well, they're actually getting the hang of two miles now. So yeah, I mean, they're, we're building progressively, but we haven't gotten into the weight stuff yet. Just the um, calisthenics type stuff. So, Cal- so Cal- yeah, it's just as good. So as far as your diet, what kind of diet are you on? I fast. That's pretty much it. So a lot, I mean, this is something that doesn't really apply to everybody else, simply because I've been lifting weights for so long that I have this muscle built up that constantly needs fuel to be sustained. So I don't really follow a specific diet. I don't really try to watch what I eat in terms of, I obviously, I, I prioritize protein. I obviously, I always get at least 150 grams of protein per day. Outside of that, I fast. And that forces me to keep calories low enough so I'm not gaining weight or I'm not losing fat. I just, it's easy for me to to maintain by fasting. If I had breakfast, if I had lunch, if I had dinner, I mean, by the time you have dinner, you're still hungry. You're just, I'm just as hungry at 5 p.m. or 4 p.m. when I break my fast as I would be as if I ate throughout the day. So it doesn't really, I mean, I don't really get lightheaded from it. I don't get super hungry throughout the day. I have a good amount of caffeine that helps with the hunger and the energy. But uh, yeah, I fast. I make sure I have my fats, my carbs, my protein, and I don't count calories or anything like that. I usually I haven't counted calories and I look the way I do. So I eat till I'm full a lot of the time and I'm good. Not not the best diet. And I eat in a way that allows me to continue to look, to look the way I do. I mean, to look a certain way, you have to check off certain boxes. Sure. A lot of people think they need a thousand, they need to be on point with a thousand different things. But in reality, it's just two things, protein, calories. That's it. If your calories are where they need to be, if your protein's where it needs to be, you're going to be able to either lose fat and build muscle at the same time, whatever you want to do. It all, all comes down to that. So I make sure my calories are where they need to be, my protein where it needs to be. If I'm putting on weight, I'll have a little bit more food. I'll just like consciously eat more. I think our body notices that if you're putting on more muscle, you're just going to be hungry to feed that muscle. That's not mm-hmm. something you have to really train yourself in. As far as the fasting, have you looked into the benefits as far as as like the cognitive benefits and how it kills cancer cells uh, yeah. like that, like that. I absolutely have. Yeah. The reason why I actually, I actually did start fasting was like, was that guy, Alex Becker, the videos that I was watching. And he said that it was, if you wake up and you know, you eat a bunch of food and you're just foggy throughout the day, you know, you're, you're slow. When I, when I don't eat breakfast, I don't eat lunch. I'm just like steady throughout the day. Everybody like wants to take a nap after they have a Thanksgiving dinner. And that's not because of, this amino acid in Turkey. It's because of the amount of calories you just ate. Just right. it, it, all the blood from your brain and your muscles just goes into your stomach to digest. 
So it makes sense. Like all your blood is draining and going into your stomach to digest everything. Not a hundred percent, but it feels that way. And the insulin and carbs and sugar, not that they're bad, but it causes your body to shift focus from fight or flight, like working hard, getting job done. I think it's a lot of like, you have to go out and hunt to get your food. And if you just wake up in the morning and you get, you get what you want, you get all your needs met first thing in the morning, the rest of the day, you're kind of like, I'm good. I had everything taken care of. I don't need to go out and like, I think our brains are still kind of in like that 20,000 years ago mode. So if you wake up, you have a bunch of food, you're just like tired because you have like, you had your food, you're going to survive for the day. So I think the fasting kind of keeps that clarity and also keeps that drive. Like, I feel like I don't, I'm very motivated throughout the day until I eat. And then I eat and then I'm just like, I want to do nothing. I'll just hang out and chill. Right. How did you land on this fasting diet? Did you try anything like vegan or carnivore or any other type of diets like that before? No, just fasting, really. I haven't done, I mean, keto a little bit. I, I had kind of blended keto and fasting together, which is kind of crazy. It's a lot of fat. No, I haven't really done anything else outside of fasting. Gotcha. When you mentioned the, like the tribal days and stuff like that. So I had another guy with an exercise science degree on uh, on my first podcast. And he mentioned the same thing about you guys have slightly different philosophies as far as lifting weights and stuff like that. But he mentioned the, you know, going out to hunt, uh, that's your walk for the day. Then your lift for the day is bringing the animal back. And, you know, and you walk back and he went through that whole thing. And it's, I do find it interesting when a lot of people, especially in the fitness industry, they go back to our tribal days because that's just how our brain's wired. So yeah, it makes sense. Philosophies. Yeah. You guys both go back to the tribal days, which is really cool. Life has never been easier than, than it has been the past 50 years, 100 years. You know, Right, right. Humans have never had it so easy. Absolutely. So I understand on your fitness journey, at some point or another, you've had some back pain like me. Yes. Yeah. So what was that like? That was painful. Yeah. That was not good. So back to high school. So actually, my freshman year of high school, I herniated my first disc. And that was right when I had started lifting weights. So I was actually playing freshman football freshman year of high school, we would, we would lift weights after practice, some of the guys. And I don't know why I was doing these overhead squats with a hundred pounds on a barbell. I was like 150 pounds at the time. So I got to the bottom of the squat and I just felt something weird. Like it didn't hurt really, but I just felt something happen in my back. And the next few days it started to get worse. And I was like, why is this pain going down my leg? Why is my back so stiff? And no, I, I had no idea what it was. Yeah. Now that I'm looking back at it, it was a herniated disc, but it eventually had gotten better, but it was bad. And I was like, this is not right. Something really bad happened. I healed. I started lifting again. I was good. About a year or two later, it happened again. I was back squatting and I just felt something happen. And it just, it didn't hurt until a few days later. And I was like, what the hell is going on? It happened again and it happened again. And then right before my freshman year of college was the worst it had ever been. I was squatting pretty much every time it happened. I was back squatting. So I was, I was back squatting and it happened again. In the next few days, it was worse than it had ever been. So my legs, back of my right leg started to go numb. And I started to lose control of my hamstring muscle, my right glute, my right calf, like all of the muscles started to kind of atrophy away. I, I couldn't squeeze them as hard as I usually could. I was like, that is not right. That's not good. So I got an MRI. It's a herniated disc. There's some pinched nerve. Therapy, physical, they therapy, they never said, squatted, dead, never squatted, dead, dead, never like, again. No way. Like, I'm no doing way. That. I'm doing that. Um, so eventually I did heal up again. And that was, this is the fresh, this is before my freshman year of, of college. This is the first time I'm going to meet my new teammates. I'm going to pitch in front of them. And I was not happy. I was like, I can't pitch right now. I can't even walk without a limp. So my freshman year of college didn't go too well in terms of baseball, just because of the back injury. I didn't have time to prepare really. And then it happened one more time throughout college with the numbness and weakness. That was before my junior year. Then ever I, since I then, I, I haven't done it. Again. I haven't herniated a disc since. I haven't had any numbness or weakness in my in my legs or anything like that. I have had some times where it acted up more than usual. But at this point, I I don't have nearly the same limitation as I did before at all. So what do you feel like caused it? Was it just inexperience as a lifter with bad form? Is that where you think got you into the back issues? Yeah, it was always one isolated, acute event. It never took time to build up. It was always like one one rep, boom, I mm -hmm. feel something happen, and my disc just exploded. That's what happened. Yeah, I think the lack of experience led to poor form, poor technique. Yeah. So it was a technique thing, but I didn't know what to do to make it better. So 
I have done a lot of research on my own and I kind of just figured out that it's core and glute strength, really. Core and your glutes are really what holds everything together. So I really hammered not just core and glute strength, but actually using them in the, the time that I need to. So like for a back squat, like I have the bar on my back, I'm squeezing my abs and my glutes as hard as I possibly can. That's protecting my lower back. My core and my glutes are taking all the force. So when I start the motion with every, with those muscles just tight and tense, I can I can sink deeper into the squat and um, everything is protected because I know I know what to do now. It's like I just keep my core as tight as I can, keep my glutes tight at the top, make sure I have you know good technique, and I haven't had any issues since. So um, yeah, a lot of uh, it was both the lack of experience. So with the sports like fixing the technique is what gives you the confidence now that that's not going to happen again, right? So you have no fear right now when you get under that bar that anything's going to happen to your back. No, I actually so uh, one of my um, Coworkers, one of my personal training coworkers, he had squatted the other day. And he had three hundred on each side on the bar, three plates. And I was the like, yeah. I'm and I was like, go up there and try it. I'm gonna try that. He was in between. So in between, he was in between. I was. I just, and, I just finished training. I just finished training a client. I was cold. I didn't warm up or anything. I just, I got him to the bar and I squatted three fifteen all the way down deep, easy, and I felt great. So amazing. That's good. That's that's a good feeling. That's good. So. I've had a lot of the same back issues you're talking about. It was always one acute event. It was usually back squatting. And yeah. it got to the point on this last one. So it would happen to me about twice a year, probably. And I would hang on one of those inversion tables and that yeah. would always fix me. It would take about two weeks. I would say after about three or four days, I was back to about 90%. And then that last, you know, five to 10% would come over two to three weeks. And then I got back surgery about three years ago on my L4, L5, because it was herniated so far that. Dude, I would go to work and I have one of these standing desks and I would stand there and type and I would just be pouring with sweat and I would be off to the side like I couldn't straighten my body out. And that started getting so bad to where I started getting shocks down my leg to where, I mean, it would feel like your legs getting cut off. Like it was just horrible and I'd never felt anything like that before. But I was just still so confident that I can hang on this inversion table and it's going to fix it. I know it's going to fix it. I know it's going to fix it. And it just never fixed it, dude. And yeah, so I ended up getting a a fusion on my L4, L5. And man, that was a horrible feeling leading up to it. Like I had a hard time walking or standing. I lost a lot of muscle mass in my legs. It was like I was walking around on two pencils, man. And I'll tell you what, right now, three years post-op, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because I haven't had an issue in that in my back at all since. Now I've stopped. I ha- I don't back squat anymore. I do squat with kettlebells, you know, holding the kettlebells up. I squat, but I don't put a bar on my back and I don't deadlift, but I do deadlift uh, kettlebells as well. So I'm glad you were able to fix it without the surgery. And, you know, a lot of my subscribers are either pondering a surgery, have had a surgery, are trying to find ways to work out with the surgery, are trying to find ways to alleviate their back pain. Um, I get emails, uh, comments all the time from my subscribers about they're just completely hopeless with, with back pain. And, you know, you know, the feeling, I know the feeling and, you know, talking with somebody like you, that's fixed a lot of these problems, I think is going to help my subscribers. So you had, you're saying a lot of muscle atrophy and you were unable, like the muscles just weren't firing, right? Was it a one-sided thing? You're saying your right side. So when you when you kind of came back to lifting again, squatting heavy and all that, were you one side dominant or, or how did you fix that? I never, so I ended up having both legs, two separate events. Legs had severe sciatica with numbness and tingling and weakness. I do think that over time, I do kind of have a little bit of a shift in my hips, the bottom of a squat. Mm-hmm. And I think it's my right side. So I've had these back issues for so long that it's leaked into other parts of my body. It's, really bad hip issues. And I think that's a lot of the reason because my glutes atrophy and a lot of the force that my glutes had taken prior are now being placed on my hip joint. So the, my left leg is stronger than my right leg just because of baseball. Cause that's my, my left leg is the plant foot. And that's the leg that kind of acts as a catapult plant into the ground. Everything else kind of rotates over it. So my left leg has always been stronger because of that. But in terms of the sciatic nerve muscles, like the glutes and hamstrings and calves, they're both, they both took a hit. So a little bit of atrophy in both sides. Do you see uh, clients that have back pain? 
Yeah, I actually have this one guy in person. He has spondylolisthesis or something. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But it's like his sacrum. This is his like S L five S one, and his sacrum is like this. It's like completely shifted. So his spine is supposed to be like that, but his sacrum is like here. So we kind of have to work on like tucking it back in, doing a lot of different core core exercises and stuff. But it's hard to kind of navigate around that with certain leg exercises. In terms of like herniated discs with clients, well, I don't know if I have any, there has to have been some in the past because a lot of people have had herniated discs. But when I hear like I've had a herniated disc before, I think about myself and I just think, well, we need to just make sure your technique is where it needs to be and that you're bracing the right areas. And we don't have to train in any super specific way. We're going to train the certain things that you need to be good at to protect your lower back, which I would do with anybody, not just the person with back pain, anybody that trains with me is going to be doing core work and glue work and stuff like that. So when I have a client that's had back pain, I just think of myself, I'm like, you're fine, man. Like a lot of your head is, I mean, obviously it depends on the severity. I'm not going to say if they're screaming in pain that they're fine, but a lot of people have a lot more in the tank than they think they do. And I don't like to completely overhaul my exercise program because they've had back pain because I, I don't train myself any differently. But obviously if they do have severe pain, I'll, I'll make adjustments. But I've had a few clients that have had back issues. Yeah. Do you think it's effective to, if they're saying, I can't squat, squatting hurts my back, to take them away from the squat for a little bit and talk about what you're saying, train the abs, train the glutes, maybe specifically isolate those and then come back to the squat later? Or how would you deal with something like that? Well, if somebody says, I can't squat because of my back, I'm going to ask them, what type of squat? Because there's hundreds of different types of squats out there. There is a variation of a squat that somebody can do without back pain. I wouldn't say, I would never say we're not going to squat. I would say we're going to find the type of squat that you can do without pain. That would be my philosophy on that. Gotcha. Are you all weights or have you tried? So I bounce around to different things. I like to uh, change up my workouts. And right now I'm on to one of those mace bell workouts and kettlebell. So what I'm big into right now, have you tried that stuff? I haven't tried the mace. I've seen a lot of videos on it. It looks very, very cool. Very interesting. It looks like a lot of stability. Kettlebells, I love. I love using kettlebells for myself and for other clients. Some exercises just work way better with kettlebells. So yeah, I don't have any like straight dogma or black and white philosophy. I'm very, I like to pick and choose certain things and what works best for me or what, what works best for my clients. So yeah, I love kettlebells. I love the mace. I've never used the mace thing before, but uh, I think it looks very interesting. Could be could be great for some people that have different limitations. I'm telling you, my shoulders have never felt better because it comes up around and down, and it just it works. This whole rotator cuff, and you know, some of the little research I've done on it is it comes from India, basically, and in that region where it came from, they don't even have a word for rotator cuff injuries or surgery. You know, it's just not a thing. Those maces completely eliminate that from the equation. So. I think it is used with some professional teams as far as baseball with the you know shoulder recovery and just preventing injury now. So it's, it's something that's coming onto the scene. I think I learned about it on probably Joe Rogan or, or one of the podcasts and gave it a try. And it's actually really, cool. I recommend it. It takes a lot of forearm strength. It humbles you like a 15 pound mace is going to humble you. Oh, I can throw that thing around everywhere. And then you're going to be like, man, this is heavier than I thought. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's something to try. I think it's perfect for baseball, forearm, shoulder. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really good. So let me finish with this. What kind of advice would you give somebody who's just starting their fitness journey today? I would say accept the fact that this is something you have to do for the rest of your life. There's no finish line. A lot of people start thinking that they'll be finished one day, but the quicker you can accept that you have to do this for the rest of your life, the sooner you'll be able to be consistent and see consistent progress. Because it's not something you can just drop and then can keep all of your, your progress. I, like I said earlier, your body doesn't want to make the adaptations, doesn't want to lose fat, doesn't want to grow muscle. So, I mean, just making sure that you understand that this is something that you're going to have to do for a long time is, is number one, first and foremost. It's a lifestyle, right? That's not a negative thing. It's a great thing because you have to find out what you can enjoy. The whole philosophy behind it is... What are you going to be able to enjoy and do for the rest of your life? Whether that be classes or kettlebells or barbells or anything. There's like so many different ways to work out. Accept the fact that it's a lifelong journey and accept the fact that your life is only going to get better from it and be open, be open-minded. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you said it well. It's going to be a lifestyle. It's going to be for the rest of your life. And the results, like so many people quit after a couple of weeks because they don't see results. 
But I'm telling you, dude, and you've probably seen the same thing. Sometimes I'll be working out really hard for weeks. I don't see the results. And then I start eating like crap and I'm taking a couple of days off. And then I see the results that I should have seen before. And it's just so weird. The thing, it's just so odd sometimes. I think it was said best by Usain Bolt, who said, I trained the last four years to run nine seconds. That's what it is, man. Like you find yourself a goal and you train like crazy. And you meet that goal and then you're on to the next thing. So it's just, you got to make it a lifestyle. You got to find some goals. And yeah, I agree, man. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with graduating high school. You're in school for 16 or like 14 years, 15 years. And then you're a senior in high school. You think you're the top dog and then you graduate and you're like, now what? So there's always got to be something you're working on in terms of fitness, especially like you never want to just be, I hear people all the time. They say, I'm just maintaining. That's not true. Like there's no such thing as a flat line in anything. Right. You're never going to be just straight. It's either going up very slowly or going down very slowly or going up really fast and down really fast. Like you're never going to be able to just maintain. So set, shoot for the stars, shoot for the moon, realize it's going to be something you have to do for life and find a way to enjoy it. Yep. I agree. Well, with that, Dylan, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Glad to talk to you. It was a great conversation and we'll be in touch. Sounds good, Mark. It was a great time talking to you. All right, sir. We'll talk later.